You know, it's interesting as we're getting ready to continue on our series of Let's Be the Church. Let's be church. We're reminded, friends, the tithes and the offerings is part of being the ecclesia, the called out ones. You know, in the early church, when they were under duress and stress, that the early church actually had all things in common. People liquidated massive assets in order to further this thing we call the church. What does that tell you? The church was so important to people. The work of Jesus Christ was such a priority that people said, listen, for this kingdom to go forth, to make sure we are establishing his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, we're willing to give up, sacrifice any earthly pleasure, materialism, any personal agenda in order to make sure the church goes forth triumphantly. And friends, that's what you're doing here. This has been an incredible season in Hemet. You know, it's interesting. I really believe this with COVID-19, with uh, the economic meltdown in our nation, with the riots in the streets, with what's happening today, friends. I believe we typify that statement I mentioned recently, that plaque on that church in Europe that says, the best of things in the worst of times. Let me say that again. And that's what the church should be. The best of things. Noah's Ark, the best of things in the worst of times. Roman captivity, friends, occupation, all that was happening in Israel, even with the great dispersion and James who wrote to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, still the church was the best of things in the worst of times times. And so I want to encourage you today, friends, wrap your heart and mind around it, and let's continue to be the church together. Uh, You can't really preach about the church. This might shock you what I'm about to say, so fasten your seatbelt. You ready? Without understanding hell. You cannot understand the church without understanding hell. Great way to put it is uh, the story is told, so I'm told, of a guy that died and went to hell, not heaven. And he was kind of like a Monty Hall, let's make a deal, or it's time to play, let's trade your salvation. And he lost on this one. And uh, he was given three choices where he wanted to spend eternity in torment. The first choice, man, nobody would want. Opens the door, and it's the worst of smells, it's the worst of sounds, it's filled with demonic activity, demons all over the place, and chains and whips, and people just in torment. And the guy said, I don't want this one. So then he came to door number two, and it was a concrete slab, and it was as hot as you could, well, as hot as you know where. And everybody had to stand on their head for eternity. And he's looking at these people, and they're just in torment. He says, I don't want that. Show me door number three. He goes to door number three, and there's lawn chairs everywhere, air conditioners and fans, and people are sipping their beverages, and they've got little finger foods and hors d'oeuvres, and uh, the only problem is all the chairs were immersed in this unbelievable foot and a half of nothing but manure. I mean, it was foul, it was ugly, it was a terrible scent, it was just icky, but There were drinks, and there was air conditioning, and the guy thought, you know what? I could get used to the smell. It's not the best, but I could get used to it. So he says, I'm going with door number three. The guy no sooner chooses his lot in eternity, there's a whistle, and the chief demon says, all right, coffee break is over. Everybody back on your head. Three choices in hell. Again, you have to understand hell Jesus talked about it at the same time he instituted and he de- de- deployed the church. If you don't understand hell, you'll never understand the church. And that doesn't mean listening to my messages is akin to hell. That's not what I'm saying. What kind of church is Jesus building? When Jesus taught on the church, I have to say it again, you write this down. He taught on hell. Bill, you're being redundant. I don't think you've heard a message like this before. And I think it's so important. Here's our big idea. The church that Jesus is building can't be stopped even by all the forces of hell. That includes COVID-19. That includes economic insanity as a nation and a world. This includes the racial division in our nation and the socioeconomic division in our nation and the political division in our country. Vital that we get this. So what Jesus is building cannot even be stopped 
by all the forces of hell. Let's read our operative passage, but this time let's read it in the Amplified Bible. Matthew 16, verse 13 to 19. Now when Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they answered, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So he remember Zebediah and Habakkuk and Obadiah, Isaiah, one of the prophets. He said to them, and this is the key, but who do you yourselves say that I am? Simon Peter replied, I love his answer, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then Jesus answered him, blessed Happy, fortunate, and to be envied are you, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood, men, have not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, this is key, you are Peter, Greek, Petros, a large piece of a larger rock. It's really a pebble, but it's still saying a large piece of a rock, okay? And on the rock, Greek, Petra, a huge rock like Gibraltar, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades, the powers of the infernal, a furnace region, shall not overpower it or be strong to its detriment or hold out against it. I will give you the keys. He holds the keys. I will give you, church, you, believer, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind, declare to be improper and and unlawful, this is a legal term, on earth, must be what is already bound in heaven. And whatever you loose, declare lawful, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as is in heaven, there it is, on earth must be what is already loosed in heaven. A whole different understanding there. Verse 18 is our focus today. And we've been on this passage for a while, friends, but you have to look at the only two places that Jesus talks about the church in order to understand what we're supposed to be. Isn't it amazing how many churches we have, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands worldwide, And many of us don't even realize what Jesus is building. We tend to build social organizations, and we tend to build economic juggernauts, and we tend to build our own self-perceived and conceived and designed structures instead of what is it that Jesus is building. So here's our focus. Let's review verse 18 in the Amplified Bible once again. Once again. And I tell you, you are Peter. That's Greek, Petros a large piece of rock. And on the rock, Greek, Petra, a huge rock like Gibraltar, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades, the powers of the infernal region. Sounds hot. It's, been, it's hot in Hemet today, guys. Where I live, it got, to be a, it got to be, I think, 107 degrees today. Yesterday, 111 degrees. Wow. And it says here, I will build my church in the gates of Hades, a little hotter in hell, by the way, the powers of the infernal region shall not overpower it or be strong to its detriment or hold out against it. Let me tell you something. I've learned that many people have a real difficulty when we in the church talk about hell. What do, we, what do I mean many people? I mean pastors. I mean church leaders. I mean church attenders, people brought up in the church. In fact, can I give you a little insight of 41 plus years of pastoring? Whenever somebody tells me, I don't believe in hell anymore. I don't believe anybody goes to hell. This is what happens with the universalism movement, that everybody gets saved and God's going to literally bring everybody to heaven eventually, and that ain't necessarily so. In fact, that is a lie of the devil from the pit of hell. But people say, oh, hell is so antiquated and hell is so cruel, and I don't believe in hell. I don't have one exception to what I'm about to tell you. Whenever a person tells me I don't believe in hell anymore, I can look at them and say, you're about to do a major sin, or you're already doing a sin. You're in an affair. You have no regard for God any longer. 
Because let's face it, if I'm going to rebel against God, if I'm not going to do God's will, if I'm not going to love God, if I'm not going to serve God, the first thing I want to get rid of from a biblical vantage point is hell. Does that make sense? And so I want you to see today why I'm not here to be a downer, why I'm not here to be negative, but I'm here to tell you, friends, within the younger generation, we're told among Gen Z individuals that about 92% of them do not believe in hell. Let me give you a perspective. As baby boomers back in the day, only about 43% didn't believe in hell. So about 92% do not believe in hell. And that's, that's an interesting thing. But I believe this version of the Amplified Bible captures the original intent better than any other version I've read thus far, and you're going to see this. Jesus says to Peter, he says, listen, Peter, listen, Petros, I got something to tell you right now. He says, you are Peter. Actually, it should be Petros. I think we got this backwards in this right now, which means the word that's used for Peter, a little piece of rock. It's still from a big piece of rock, so it's still something pretty significant. So here you are. You're, you're a rock. Now, he doesn't say, and this is where the Catholics have really blown it, guys, and I'm not anti-Catholic. He's not in any way saying that, um, Peter, you're the Pope, and I'm going to build my church on you, because that's what the Catholics teach, that Peter was the rock of revelation, and Peter is the foundation of the church, and Peter is the founding father. And Well, first of all, there was no Catholic church for 300 more years, and it was not built on Peter, and that's just not accurate. And this, what he's saying, no, 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 you are Peter. He says, you're like a little pebble, man. It's a big piece of rock, but it's from a gigantic rock at Gibraltar. And he's saying, what the revelation is that I'm building the church on, the rock I'm building the church on, Peter, it's actually the rock that your revelation, that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. He says that upon this rock, Petra, which means, here it is, uh, uh, huge rock. Bigger than this, by the way, but a huge rock. He says, Peter, you got it, man. You're going to be built on this rock of revelation. And upon this rock of revelation, I will build my church and the gates of hell. The gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Just hold that thought for just a moment. He tells Peter that the gates of Hades, that is the powers of the inferno, like the towering inferno, you remember that movie, okay? He's saying that, I'm telling you, a furnace, the crucible, this place of unbearable heat. That's Palm Springs if you live in Hemet, much hotter than here, right? It shall not prevail against the church. He, what, what does that mean? In Greek, it means it shall not overpower it. From this passage on the building of God's church, I'm going to focus on one phrase today. You'll want to write it down. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. You're going to learn something today. The church that we are building today is to be of such a force that the very gates of hell are not able, what's the word? To prevail against it. Now, why is this important? I'm wondering, how much hell has there been in your marriage? Whoa, here he goes again. How much hell has there been in raising your children? How much hell is there in your relationship with your parents? How much hell has there been in your dating life? How much hell is there because you're bound by a spirit of fornication? How much hell has there been in your finances? We sing, heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory and grace. I want to see my Savior's face. Heaven is a wonderful place. I want to go there. But what about the hell portion of what even we in the church and the ecclesia and the called out ones in the gathering are actually going through? This church is to be of such a force that even Satan's best hit, his sucker punch, cannot prevail against what God's doing in your life. That's why the scripture says, he who has started a good work in you. It's a good work. If God started it, it's always a good work. 
okay? Guess what? He who started a good work in you, it is going to be completed. But it's going to be not until the coming of the Lord. But it's a progressive work that he is doing in your life. Now, I'm not sure most people understand what this phrase really means. Do you really understand? I have heard a lot of sermons that are not scriptural. What does it mean? The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. The gates of Hades will not prevail against the church. When we speak of the church, Jesus only mentions the church in Scripture. Guess how many times? I already said it. I'm not going to give you the answer. Any idea? Peace, baby. Two times. Two times. Why is that? Now, in these two chapters, it gives us a total concept in just two little chapters of what the church is and what's supposed to be and how we're to operate. And yet, friends, I have been a part of many churches. I have visited many churches, and the majority of people sitting in the pews or the theater seats are clueless. The majority of pastors, friends, of what the church is really supposed to be. We look to church growth consultants. We look to church growth books. We look to denominational insight. What does the United Methodist say it should be? What do the Presbyterians say it should be? What do the different Baptist groups say it should be? What do the Pentecostals say it should be? You, 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 you get it, right? Now, we have thousands of books written on what the church is and what the church ought to look like. Books like The Purpose Driven Church, and that's a great book. I, I love the book. We, we, we have books, friends, on Unleashing the Church by a guy back in the day named Frank Tillipaw. Great books. I'm not against it. Books on how to have a seeker-sensitive church, how to have a faith-oriented church, how to have a cell group-driven church, how to have a faith-oriented church. <clears throat> now, we'll never grasp this thing we call the church unless we first understand. I'm being redundant for a reason. We have to first understand what Jesus says it is. You know what? This bothers me a little bit, but not really. It doesn't matter what Bill Wolfson thinks the church should be. But I said that for a reason. It doesn't matter what you say the church says, or what you say the church ought to be. You say hi, I say bye, doesn't matter. I say hi, you say low, you say potato, I say potato, doesn't matter. What does Jesus say, this thing he died for, this thing he said, Lord, let them be one as we are one so the people will believe the Father has sent the Son. What does he say it ought to be? It is Jesus that's building this church. Can you say that with me? It is Jesus that is building, by the way, says his church. I will build my church, my church. It is Jesus building his church, not church growth consultants, not pastors, not elder consuls, not deacons. It's not, staff. it's not a staff. It's not even a good witty idea. It's Jesus. I want to connect with what Jesus is building. We learned last session that Jesus is building a church that is in balance. Remember the word? Who remembers the word? Echaleo mosaine, the balanced church. We brought a Hebrew word together, echaleo, I mean, sorry, mosaine, and we brought a Greek word, echaleo. And we learned that when God's doing something, you don't always feel balanced because whenever you lift up one foot, you're out of balance. To get to a new place of balance and stability, you must lift your foot for a moment and just trust in the Lord. Though you fall, he will not let you be cast down. The Lord is upholding you with his right hand of righteousness. But you're a little shaky when you lift that foot, but then planet. You're founded and rooted and established in Christ. We learned that last week. Listen to us online, friends. We give you these teachings for free, so we're without excuse not to listen, if you will. This is the kind of church, a church, Echeleo Mosaine, a balanced church that Jesus says the gates of Hades. He actually doesn't really say hell. He says Hades, but it's another word for hell. But you're going to learn something today. This is the kind of church that the gates of Hades will not prevail against. What does that tell you? What does that tell you? This church that Jesus is building on this rock of revelation, and here you are founded and established just like Peter, and he's building it. He's saying right now, if we build this thing right, if we build this thing based on Jesus' schematic diagram, 
If we look at Jesus' manual for how to build the church, this is the only church that the gates of Hades will not prevail against. In other words, he's saying, get, come on, figure out, look at the converse. Every other kind of church that we build that Jesus is not involved in, that Jesus is not connected to, that Jesus has not given us the blueprint for, the gates of hell will prevail against it. This is why we see so many churches falling apart. We see so many churches falling. I mean, literally, they're not just falling apart. We see so many churches that are closing their doors. You see, friends, a lot of people are building a church that's only for a certain age group. We're saying we don't want the younger people. And they're closing their doors. And by the way, the younger people then buy your church pennies on the dollar. Or worse yet, a non-church concern, a non-ecclesiastical concern, they buy it. We have to ask, what is Jesus building? How do I make sure I'm building what Jesus is building? Because then hell will have no stronghold or foothold or place in our church. The church that Jesus is building can't be stopped. Now, to get this now, I'm going to show you this in these two chapters. Even by all the forces of hell, people often say, Bill, why do you preach about hell? It's so negative. Friends, it isn't. Jesus Christ died that we might live. Jesus Christ died that we might spend eternity with him. Jesus Christ died that as a result of what happened in the Garden of Eden, the day you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. You don't have to die. He's taken the sting out of death. He's taken the victory out of the grave, and he's taken your reservations in Hades, and he has said, I've reversed the curse. And you've now got the keys to heaven. This is a cool thing. So here's the first question today as we're talking about the church. And it's an important question to answer. Is Hades hell? And the gates of hell shall not prevail. Well, there's many words that are interpreted in the King James and in many Bibles as hell. And it's not exactly done correctly. But is Hades hell? I'm not going to answer that. Is Gehana Another word used for hell, is that hell? Is Sheol, which means the abode of the dead, hangout of the dead, is that hell? Is the abyss, the Bible speaks of the abyss, is that hell? Then we have the lake of fire. If you want to go water skiing there, you need as best as skis, right? Well, let me help you out, friends. Is that hell? So which one of these words, we're going to unpack this a little bit today, speak of the real hell? Did I mention to you earlier like 10 times that if you do not understand hell, you'll never understand the church that Jesus is building. We don't want to get people saved because we've scared the hell out of them. We want people to know there's a heaven to be gained and a hell to be shunned and why this is important. And friends, for those of you watching today who don't believe in hell, you feel you're too intelligent, you feel that it just doesn't fit into your generational paradigm or worldview, even if you don't believe in hell, I got some interesting news for you. Hell still believes in you. There are many people that are shocked when they close their eyes and they're absent in their body and they're present with the enemy. They miss the whole thing. And I just want to kind of Lay this out here, friends. So one of the best things as we read in the screw tape letters by C.S. Lewis that the enemy can do to war against the church and war against our purpose in the church and war against you spending an eternity with Jesus Christ is get you to minimize and trivialize hell. Get you to say, "Uh, there is no hell. I've got all the time in the world. If the enemy can get you to believe you have enough time and that there is no hell, he's got you. There's not a question about that, friends. So here it is. Which one of these words? Is it Sheol? Is it the abyss? Is it the lake of fire? Is it Hades? And there's other words, friends. Which one of these is the, would the real hell stand up? You know, friends, is there more than one hell? Could that be it? Which one of these words? There's the question. I wonder, wonder who, do, 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 do. Which is the real hell? Which one? Which one of these speak of the real hell? What is the difference in part of understanding hell between a demon and a fallen angel? Friends, we have such an interesting faith in the church and an interesting interpretation of Scripture. A demon and a fallen angel may not be the same thing. 
This is part of what we're unpacking. Where does a, re a redeemed spirit go when he dies or she dies? And where does an unredeemed spirit go? So in other words, when you die, you remember the story of a guy named Lazarus, a, a, a beggar? And a rich man who died and one went to Abraham's bosom, a place called paradise. And the other one went to where? The other side. Well, what was it? Was it hell? Was it Hades? Was it Sheol? Bill, will you just give me the answer and I'm going to give you, I don't want to, I don't want to frustrate you. My answer is no. Absolutely not. It's so important you get this today. Because friends, People do not get saved because of fear. People do not stay saved and get saved because you scare the hockey sticks out of them. But that being said, friends, people need to know the truth. So Jesus says, I'm going to build my church. Here he is. You're a part of it. Come on, you're just like Peter. And the gates of hell will... Ne this is an unmovable rock. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. Why am I taking this much time? Why am I saying this over and over and over? I think your eternity and my eternity is worth it. I think it's so important. We have to get it right. Well, but churches don't preach about this anymore, Pastor. Don't you realize you're so past that you're right? Guilty. Guilty. Churches don't preach about, in many cases, the blood, the cross, sin, and a real hell. These are words. We're more into what the world needs now is love, sloppy agape. We, we, we have a whole different approach, and I'm not saying love's not real, but Jesus brought this up for a real reason. So the actual word used for the gates of hell is, write it down, Hades. Hades. The power of death will never have the power to destroy the church. Isn't that interesting? We're gonna, it brings up hell, so we're going to talk about it. But the power, the power, you've got to see this right now, okay? Of death will never have the power to destroy the church. That comes directly from the Phillips translation of the Bible. It says here in the Berkeley translation, and the gates of hell shall not hold out against the mighty moving church. Oh, I love that. I love that. I love that. The church is moving, and the gates of hell shall not hold out. What does this mean? A lot of us have a weird view of the gates. We think gates move. Who storms the gates? Do we storm the gates, or are the gates chasing us? That sounds like a horror flick for sure. Why did Jesus say that the gates of Hades would not prevail as opposed to the gates of Gehenna? That's another word for hell. Why didn't he say, and the gates, he, he chose Hades. He had five words, and really probably seven, but in this case, he had five different ways of saying hell that he could have chosen. Did I mention to you it's important to understand this, to understand why the church is powerful and why the church wins and why the gates of hell do not prevail against the church. We cannot fully understand the church if we do not understand this place that we're not supposed to be overtaken by. You know, it's interesting. The Bible says you will be overtaken by blessings. I like this. It says, goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. It's a picture of goodness and mercy are these two gigantic forces that chase you down and tackle you and bring you into the purposes of God. What does hell have to do with the church? Isn't that a great question? What does hell have to do with the church? I'm going to take some time to explain hell to you this evening. Why would I do that? Ask me that question at the end. Join us in the Zoom Zoom room, the Zoom Zoom room. We'll, be, we'll open it up at about, I don't know, 7.30 uh, tonight, Pacific time. And we're going to spend about a half hour in there. But I want you to take some great notes today. I'm going to share some thoughts that, well, do I dare say this to you, may challenge your theology. Because we have very unscriptural thinking on both heaven and hell. Do we spend eternity in heaven? Or is it the new Jerusalem? There's a new heaven, there's a new earth. There's a millennium for a thousand years. Do we go there? 
There's a lot of questions to ask. Many think that hell is occupied by damned souls right now. If we went down to hell, who would be there? Would it be Mussolini? Do you know who that is? Adolf Hitler. Would it be Idi Amin from Uganda and the terrible things that he did? Would it be Richard Speck, who back in the 1960s killed mercilessly eight nurses on the south side of Chicago? Would it be Charles Manson that we would find in hell? Who's hanging out in the undesirable real estate district known as hell? Many think hell is occupied by damned souls right now, and this may not be spiritually correct. There are those who believe there is only one hell. Well, the problem is that's not biblically correct. Don't throw rotten tomatoes at me quite yet. Let's hear the whole thing. Many of us have unscriptural attitudes. This is all to do with understanding the church. Can you believe it? Well, get on with it. Well, I might in a little bit. But there there, there are those. Many of us have unscriptural attitudes about demon spirits. Many of us actually, friends, is, well, that's just where it's at. We're, we're not sure fallen angels or foul spirits or demon spirits or who was legion, this guy who was possessed. And, it's, and, and he said, and Jesus said, who are you? Who are the demons in you? And he says, we are legion, for we are many. Yeah. Is it possible that much of what we believe is based on impressions and based on opinions as opposed to the Word of God. Hmm. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but he doesn't live by his own impressions, his own illusions, his own visions, his own opinions, his own conjecture. He lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Matthew 16, 18 uses the word Hades for hell. Say that with me. Hades for hell. Hades for hell. Hades for hell. When Jesus said, I will build, this is so important, my church. It's not Wolfson's church. Don't tell tell anybody you go to Wolfson's church. That'll ruin it, man. It's not my church. It's his church. When he said, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades cannot hold out against it. That's what he actually said, literally. Can't hold out against it. What was he really saying? Oh, I can't. Can you tell I'm into this? I don't know. Does it show? Bill, why are you so excited about hell? I'm not. I'm excited about your authority, your power, your ability to loose, your ability to bind. Wait till you see this. Oh, man. Where are the gates of hell, by the way? And where is Hades? Just in case, you know, there's a Broadway musical that's done very well, obviously, because of COVID-19. It's been sidelined for a while. But, you know, it's interesting. It's called Hades Town, And they almost um, treat it as the River Styx and this place under the earth that you go to. And they don't exactly get it right. So I'm asking you, where are the gates? Where's Hades? Well, if it's Hades Town, it's in New York City. And two of my great technical crew leaders here, uh, that's Mike and Fran Zipper, they're from New York, and they might think that's Hades, they might think that's hell, maybe you think it too, but I actually think it's a pretty good place. Let's look at it, 2 Peter 2, 4, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, this is a different message today, friends, but cast them down to hell. Did you get that? If God spared not the angels, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto what? Judgment. God spared not the angels. They sinned. But he cast them down. It tells us right there. He threw them down into hell. And then they're in hell. He delivered them into chains. But what are the chains? They were chains of darkness. You know, ever seen such darkness you can't even see? The finger right there in front of your eyes. And then it was for a later time. Notice that hell is not a place now where all these people are yelling and screaming and freaking out. Uh, they, They are and they're not. But they're reserved unto judgment. And this is not a teaching on hell today. It's a teaching on the church. 
Bill, this is so strange. Guess what? A lot of people end up in hell because they don't want to hear about it. They don't want to learn about it. But Jesus spoke on the subject of hell. And the word of God speaks on the subject of hell over and over and over. So when you talk about these fallen angels, Peter's speaking about the fallen angels that were cast out of heaven. Let's start with that. For God spared not the angels that had sinned. So when Lucifer said, I will ascend beyond God, Satan says, I'm taking over. It's mutiny in the high heavens. There were these fallen angels that had sinned. So that's who Peter's talking about right here. We know that for a fact. It tells us they were cast out of heaven and thrown into where? There's two hockey sticks at the end. That's right. Hell. It, this, is what it, this is what it's telling us. The word is a hell that was reserved for them. You've got to get this here. It says this is a hell that was specifically reserved for fallen angels. Reserved in Greek means kept, retained, imprisoned. Now that's not all of hell, and there is a hell for people, but we've got to get this. It tells us they were cast into a place called Teratus, T-A-R-A-T-U-S. This is a place that was reserved just for them. Bill, do we have to really go through this to learn about the church? Well, as they used to say on Rowan and Martin's, uh, Rowan and Martin's laughing, you bet your sweet bippy you do. It, so here it is in Teratus. This is a place. This is the only place in Scripture right here that the word Teratus is used. 2 Peter 2, 4. This is confirmed in Jude uh, 6, okay? Only one chapter, so it's verse 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate, heaven is a wonderful place, but left their own habitation, they had it made. Isn't it amazing? Even in the church, we can have everything that God has foreordained for us before the foundations of the world. We have this inheritance in Christ. And for so many of us, God gives us a few simple rules like don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The day you eat of it, you're going to die and you get it. There's the one tree, just one tree you can't eat, just one tree. I want my maple. I want the one tree. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but they left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So here we've got Tertius. Here we have this great judgment. So this is a part of what hell is. Bill, do we really need to know about this? Yes, we do. This is a place called Hades and a place, or there is a place called Hades and also Tertius. But Tertius specifically for the fallen angels. This is where angels are kept in prison, but we're seeing that Tertius seems to have this symbiotic relationship with Hades. It seems that Tertius is a compartment of Hades. Watch this. This is where angels are kept in prison and chained, and they're not playing video games. They're not just hanging, man. They are waiting specifically for judgment day. We know that there's a Hades, and I'll explain that later on. When you see this, friends, you're about to see the kingdom in a whole new light. When you see this, you're going to look at the magnitude of the manner of love God has for you. When you see this, you're going to see you've got a choice of eternal life or eternal damnation. We're going to see something fascinating here. We know that there's a Tertius, a place where fallen angels, write this down, are kept. Bill, why is this important to know because God brings it up in the Word? We're supposed to study and show ourselves approved? We're supposed to be workmen of God. We're supposed to work the workmanship of God and work the workmen of God. We don't want to be ashamed. We want to rightly divide the word of truth. Revelation chapter 9, verse 7 through 11 says, The locusts, here's end time books, friends. You want to know about the book of Revelation? Here it is. The locusts looked like horses prepared for battle. On their heads, they wore something like crowns of gold, and their faces resembled human faces. Their hair was like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. Some think this is major airplanes, and there's a lot of facts, but I'm not going to do that. They had tails and stings 
like scorpions. And in their tails, they had power to torment people for five months. Where's the love of God? Oh, it's here. Where's the church? It's here. Where is heaven? It's here. Okay. Now, no, 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 no. Here it is. They had tails and stings like scorpions, and in their tails they had the power to torment people for five months. They had as king over them, uh uh-oh, here it is, the angel of the, what is it? What is it? Abyss. You've got Tertus, you've got Hades, you've got, what is it? The abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Ebedon. And in Greek, Apollyon. Oh, it's interesting. It's also interesting how you see a lot of the Greek gods in Greek mythology. Many people believe that the different Greek gods, whether it was Zeus or Hera or Apollo or Aphrodite or whoever, were actually demonic, satanical manifestations. Here it is now. The word power is authority. It's not the word dunamis, that you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. This is not God's power. This is a satanical power. We have another Greek word to explain hell. Abyss. This abyss, I hope you're taking some notes today. This abyss is different than Hades, and it's different than the place The angels, the fallen angels who screwed up with Satan are kept. This is different. Did I mention to you we need to understand this to understand the church and our authority in the church? And what does it mean the gates of Hades, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church? This abyss, here it is. You've heard of the bottomless pit? That's right. You got it. All right, good, good. This abyss is a bottomless pit. And out of it comes demon spirits. It didn't say fallen angels. Whoa, demon spirits. It doesn't say fallen angels possess you. It wasn't fallen angels that lived in legion, the demon possessed, uh, the, 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 the man who was possessed. There's a little bit of a difference. This abyss is a bottomless pit, and out of it comes demon spirits that are able to cause great harm. So this pa- passage speaks of demon spirits, not necessarily fallen angels. Let's move on to Revelation 20, verse 10. We will get back to the church. We're actually laying a foundation. Did you you ever think you needed, did anyone ever tell you you need to understand hell to understand heaven? You need to understand Hades, and you need to understand the abyss, and you need to understand the bottomless pit or the lake of fire. You need to understand this to understand the inheritance that we have in Christ, to see what Jesus is building. Why did he build his church? Why did he say the gates of hell would not prevail against it? This is vital. What he's our savior. What's he saving us from? The fallen angels are reserved for that great judgment. They never got a do over, they never got a second chance. Important you remember that. Revelation 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast, oh, it's in Revelation, and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever and ever and ever. So there really is a place where people are tormented. Why don't think God's loving? I appreciate your opinion. Thanks for playing. But you're wrong. But who is it? The Lord has done everything to keep you from this place. Well, I don't think a loving God would ever do this to us. And I agree with you. You didn't think. Do you see, friends, every one of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and every one of us are deserving of hell. That's a fact. If the Lord only saved one person, it would be more than enough. If he would have only saved one person, it is more than I deserved. If he only would have saved one person, it is still God's unthinkable, unmentionable, phenomenal, uncomprehensible uh, grace, if you will. It does not say that the devil was thrown into the bottomless pit. It doesn't say that. It says he was thrown into the lake of fire. You got a bottomless pit over here, but you got a lake of fire. Bill, are we splitting theological hairs? I don't think so. The Greek word for hell here, okay, when we talk about the lake of fire is Gehenna. Gehenna. 
G-A-H-H-E-N-N-A. Gehenna is a lake of fire with brimstone. By the way, all these words in the King James are translated hell. 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 Is that right? I'm not finished yet. Uh, type in some messages right now. I want to see if, I want to hear from you. Are you saying, oh, man, this is so boring. Why would you bring it up? Some of you are going to thank me on the other side of eternity. You're going to miss hell because of this message, this series. Some of you right now, I'm telling you in Jesus' name, you feel that you're already in hell and you're living hell. You've said this. Here it is. Friend, listen to me. You said, my marriage is a hell and my husband's the Antichrist. You know what I'm talking about? And you're going to find out your worst situation right now can't even touch the hem of the garment of hell, if you will. Who even knows, type it in the message bar if you're watching us online right now, what brimstone even is. We talk about fire and brimstone. Revelation 20, verse 14 to 15. And death, you got to get this. Oh, this is good. This is good. Bill, why are you so excited about hell? Did you also enjoy um, tearing wings off lightning bugs? No, I didn't. Friends, I just love seeing people redeemed. I love seeing them reconciled to God. I love just, oh, guys, I got to move on. I got to move on. So here it is. What's brimstone? What is brimstone? Well, by the way, we say a preacher is a hell, fire, and what? Brimstone preacher. And yet we don't even know. What's brimstone? What is it? Before you call me something, (laughs) we got to know what it is. Revelation 20, verse 14 and 15. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. It's not enough to say DOA, dead on arrival, we pronounce you dead. Uh huh. Oh, oh, this is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life, that is, as we see at Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, the Lamb's book of life, and was not found written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. Notice this, this is important, that death and Hades is thrown into the lake of fire. The different hells do come together at the end, it would appear. So there comes a place when it's all said and done, there's one hell. There's one hell. But it's comprised of a number of variables and factors and insights here, friends. So watch. Remember Jesus said he was the one, there it is, who had what? The keys. Say it with me. The keys of death and hell. He holds the keys. The keys. I've got an actual, authentic replica of the real key. No, I don't. He says, I hold the key. I'm holding it, man. So what does this mean? Remember Jesus said he was the one who had the keys of death and hell. It is important that Jesus did not say, it's important that Jesus did not say that the church would prevail against Gehenna or the abyss or Tetratus. Why did Jesus choose the word Hades? We're back to the church again. Why did he say we prevail against Hades? You see, friends, this is important. The word Sheol in the Hebrew, say it with me, Sheol. S-H-E-O-L, Sheol, is the same word as Hades, okay? Same thing. You got to get this. So the Greek and the Hebrew, same thing. The word Hades is translated hell, grave, or pit. The word Hades, grave, hell, or pit. Hades literally means the place of departed spirits. In mythology, they would call it like the river sticks, at least the entryway, the, wind, the, 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 the gateway into hell. The word Hades literally means unseen. The unseen spirits, the unseen spiritual warfare, there it is. Hades is a place for the departed spirit. So where are we going to go with this now? The church that Jesus is building cannot be stopped even by all the forces of hell. Death cannot stop it, friends. Nothing unseen can stop it. The grave can't stop it. The pit can't stop it. So which spirits 
go to Hades, because he said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. So we know that Tertius is a place for what? Fallen angels. you got to write this down. This is important. There will be a test. We'll talk about this in the Zoom Zoom room. If the angels are in Tertius, then who are those who appear before us as angels of light? It says there are angels of light who would deceive even you and me, the elect, if it were possible. So the abyss is where demonic spirits and evil spirits are kept. They're differentiated, friends. There's a strong argument that there's a difference between this group of fallen angels and these these, um, demonic spirits. We never see fallen angels trying to possess a person or being cast out of a body, not once in Scripture. I believe Scripture makes it clear that it is evil spirits and demons that come out of the abyss in order to torment people. So who are they and how do they come to be? That's not for this series, friends, but it's a worthwhile study. There are three places that are referred to in the Scripture as prisons of hell. Write this down. One, the prison of Hades, the prison of Tertius, and the prison prison of, what was it? The abyss. There are three different places accomplishing three different things. Hades is a place that we're talking about today that human spirits that are not redeemed are kept until judgment. Teratus is a place where foreign angel, fallen angels are kept until that final judgment, if you will. So what is this whole place here of Hades? It is a place that holds damned spirits. It's not where Jesus went to preach. The Bible says that Jesus went and preached to the captives in hell. He led captivity captive. He preached to them, and there are those he brought to redemption. That's a different place. That's a different place. So if you're saved, then your spirit upon death, where does it go? This is all about understanding the church, friends. We're not even going to finish it today, but i got to get some of this done. It goes right before the Father, 2 Corinthians 5, 8. We are confident, I say, and willing, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So, believers do not go to Hades. Not one believer will ever go to Hades. It is reserved for damned spirits. So what does this mean? We have no fear of Hades, and there will be a day that it will be thrown into the abyss or to Tertius. So here's the question. Do you want to go to heaven? Some of you look a little afraid like I'm going to take you out right now. I don't mean right now, but how many of you ultimately do want to go to heaven? For me, heaven... I don't care about the geography of heaven or the topography of heaven. New Jerusalem works for me. New heaven, new earth. I just want to go wherever Jesus is at. Do you want to go to heaven? However, for the unsaved, they go to a prison upon death for souls known as, what is it? Sheol in the Hebrew or Hades. So when it comes time for the final judgment, all three hells will be dumped into what? The lake, that's right, of fire. There will only be one hell for all of eternity. Bill, this is such hell preaching. No, it's not hell. It's not fire. It's not brimstone. It's foundational to understanding the key that Jesus gives to the church. The potential of what you can bind, what you can loose, what you can do at the gate That's leading to Hades. Once somebody's in Hades, there ain't a thing or a thing that you or I can do. But before they get there, before they get there, I feel like something good is about to happen. There will only be one hell for all of eternity. Satan and the beast and the false prophet and the fallen angels and all the souls of Hades will be thrown into Gehenna. Or the lake of what? That's right, fire. What is this place called? What is this place that we call Gehenna? Can you help me with this? In the Old Testament, you read about a place called the Valley of Hinnon. Whoa, oh, Gehenna, Hinnon, same thing. Another name is the Valley of the Children. Another name, the Valley of Weeping. 
This is the word translated in the New Testament for the lake of fire or Gehenna. Friends, have you ever heard this preached before? This is so important. In the Old Testament, the Israelites built an altar to the east side of Hinnon. This is going to take about 10 more minutes, friends. Don't you go anywhere. Don't, I'm, I'm telling you, you've got to get this today. They placed two iron hands on the altar of Baal. The Jews were doing this, friends. So they had this altar, and the Jews got into pagan worship, and they got into satanical or slash demonic influences. They did this also with Baal, if you will, Baal worship. This altar would be filled from the valley with the fires of Hinnon, and they would roast their children alive. Wow. You could hear the screams of torment as you could smell the burning flesh. So with Gehenna, the Lord is using a reality that was taking place at the time. He's showing us something that will blow your mind here. It was such a place of suffering. It was such a place of weeping. It was such a place of anguish. And it was such a place of torment. This was known as a place of horrible smells, scream, misery, and torment. He said this was a real place. The Jews knew of it. They knew what the apostate, they knew what the heretics, they knew what people who were not serving God, they knew what the idolaters had got involved in. And he says, you think this is bad? It's a piece of cake, a walk in the park, as horrible as it was, compared to a life and an eternity without Jesus. They would bring out the Baal worshipers, Baal being satanical, and their instruments, musical instruments, in order to drown out the screams of the people. Isn't that interesting? It sounds like an abortuary, abortions. It sounds like we love to sing our songs and we love to scream and work into a frenzy and have our parties and everything, and we try to drown out the smells of there is a heaven to be gained, but there is a hell to be shunned. Okay? How many still drown out the sounds of misery and torment as people go to the valley of hell today during Auschwitz? There was a Baptist church right on the road on the way there. And as the Jews were screaming, knowing about the gas chambers, knowing about the crematoriums, knowing about what was happening, their godless destiny, they would have the worship leader sing louder and they'd play the music louder to drown out the sounds of torment. You see, friends, I, I find this interesting. So back in the days, what we're talking about today with hell, the Jews would work themselves into a frenzy as their children and virgin daughters would be roasted alive. Why is this important? And I'm just going to let you folks know I am usually stop about now. We're going to go about an extra five minutes. This is too important. This is too important. I think too many of us have given up on this concept, friends, and I really believe many of us live our life like hell because we don't believe in hell anymore. And here the Lord is saying, I'm giving you guys a key. We can't get into that today. And I'm giving you authority. And the gates of hell, of Hades, they're not, it's not going to prevail against the church. But what does that really mean? It's against this backdrop that God, about looking at the Valley of Hinnon, John gets the real vision, the real prophetic insight to what the real hell that's magnified zillion times over from the Valley of Hinnon, as horrible as it was, what it was really like. He didn't use the word Hades or Abyss. He chose the word Gehenna. This was the garbage dump of Jerusalem in John's day. Isn't that interesting? They would burn garbage 24 hours hours a day in Gehenna. They would, the brimstone was the stone that would keep the trash burning 24-7. Fire and brimstone, continuing suffering and torment and weeping. John informs us that all the unredeemed souls and fallen angels and the beast, and you've got this, the Antichrist, that he says they're going to be thrown into the lake of fire. But he's comparing it to the garbage dump, the Gehenna of Jerusalem. We fail to realize how long-term hell really is. 
How do I explain eternity to you? Fasten your seatbelts, friends. We're going to finish this portion of the message today because I've got something. You've, I've got to give you a little bit of an insight. Let's just say there's this gigantic hole that could literally facilitate all of the sand of both the sea and the dry land of the earth. And let's say an angel was commissioned to take one grain of sand once a year, boom, and put it in that hole. And he does this, and after millions and billions and trillions of years, he fills this gigantic hole with all the sand. And the Lord says, now you're going to take one grain of sand every year, ding, and put it back where you found it. And he does this for millions, billions, and trillions of years. You would not even begin to scratch one day of eternity. Huh. Isn't that something? We fail to recognize how long-term it is. John took the worst that the human mind could imagine, and then he began to explain hell. The essence of hell is this. We still have desires, dreams, hopes, but no ability to fulfill these desires. Friends, don't tell me on the side of eternity you can't fulfill your desires. Don't tell me that there's not visions and dreams and mandates God can give you. And as difficult as this, you can get it done. And many of us were living our life and saying, this earth is a hell. Friend, you got no idea. I have no idea. There's shouting and torment, and, and there's want and unmet desires for eternity. This is the gates of hell that will not prevail against the church. But I haven't even told you how this compares or connects with the church yet. The church that Jesus is building can't be stopped, even by the forces of this hell that I've just described. So, if anything should give us a passion a passion for spirits, unsaved, unregenerated souls, hell should. Friends, hell should not be a thing of fear for us. But I gotta ask you a question. Raise your hand at home right now if you believe there's a real hell. A real hell. Oh, believe me, there is. And yet, the majority of Christians in the church today, five years after getting saved, have not led one person to Christ. The majority. Very seldom do you hear of a Christian that has actually gone to the highways and byways and compelled one person to come in. In heaven, all of our needs are met. In hell, you still have desires, but not one need can be met. Now, many of you know I like to finish at a certain time, and many of you know I'm not stopping until I get you to a certain point. And don't say, well, that's hell. No, it really isn't. This is a gateway to heaven what I'm about to share. God has so much in store for us that our own body cannot even contain it. Our own mind cannot even fathom it, perceive it. We will receive a new body that can contain, a resurrected body, all that God has for us. We will never get tired of worshiping God again. You could never worship God for eternity with your current body. But with your resurrected body, you can. Our current body can't even behold God in his glory because any man who looks upon me face to face will die. Hmm. A true belief in hell will motivate us all to evangelize. Do we really have a passion? I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Do we really have a passion to keep others out of hell? Or are we one of those individuals we make other people's life like hell? Or are we one of those individuals that, yeah, we believe in hell, but not enough to keep others from going to hell? If a person's home was burning to the ground, would you rush in there to save them from death? I hope so. Matthew 16 and 18 gives us the insight into what our mission must be on earth, and it's against the backdrop of hell, and I'm only going to give you coming attractions to next week. I hope you're getting something out of this. Well, Pastor, I was just hoping you'd have a real feel-good message here at the end. You know what? Here it is. Hell is real, so get real and let's get people saved. Hell is real, so let's get real to our call from the Lord that, man, we are called to bring people into the kingdom of heaven from the kingdom of darkness. Jesus says, I will build a church so powerful that it's going to contain my keys. Oh, oh, oh. 
it will contain my keys. He says the gates of Hades that are keeping people bound in their minds and their bodies and their spirits cannot hold out against the church. Once somebody's in Hades, there ain't a thing you can do and there's nothing I can do. Jesus tells us that when the church moves in his power, that the gates of hell will no longer be able to hold people captive. And we're going to see men and women set free. Do you love seeing people set free? You know, who in the sun sets free is free indeed. Jesus tells us that when the church moves in his power, that the gates of Hades will no longer be able to hold people captive, and we're seeing men and women set free. Jesus is telling the church that we have the power and authority to set people free. Yes, friends, you are all that in Christ. He is not speaking of a second chance for those who are already dead. Man, once you're dead, to be absent in the bodies, to be present with the Lord. Rather, he's saying, get this. We will build his church the way he calls us to. Then he goes on and says that the gates of Hades will be unable to claim any soul that we target as long as they're on this side of the gates. Deceived people are bound by cults and the old cult and drugs and gangs, you get it, will no longer be bound when we realize and when they realize they're standing at the gates of Hades and we can push those gates back that have their mind in bondage, their hearts in bondage, their priorities in bondage. And guess what? We can claim these spirits for the Lord. Do you believe that? Friends, do you really believe that? Do you really believe the word? In fact, the church is the people that are called to break down the gates. Matthew 16, 18 says, And I tell you, you are Peter, Petra's a little pebble, and on this rock, the Greek Petros, a huge rock, like Gibraltar, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, the powers of the infernal region, shall not overpower it or be strong to its detriment or hold out against it. We can go to the very gates of Hades. Whew. Don't worry about fallen angels. Don't worry about demonic spirits. We can go to the very gates of Hades and rescue souls that are about to step over to the other side and be permanently unredeemed. The church fails to recognize, you hold the keys, guys, how powerful we really are. The church is not called to hold the fort until Jesus comes. No, we give the enemy way too much credit. The enemy should not, get this, the enemy should not be knocking on the church door, but we should be tearing down the gates of deception and reclaiming God's property. Once they get on the other side of Hades, it's too late. It's too late, babe, it's too late. The church that Jesus is building can be stopped even by all the forces of hell. And it's incredible. It's massive. It's huge. But it's nothing compared to this treasure you have in earthen vessels. We're so afraid of the world's influence on our children. Oh, I don't want to live in California anymore. It's, a, it's, a, it's such a liberal state and they do such terrible. Oh, will you just stop that? I'm serious now, guys. Many Christians have closed their own gates, and we refuse to get near the gates of Hades. Head for the hills there, Chester. Let's get out of here. This is so... Oh, come on. That was a slap. Friends, you've been born for such a time as this. You've been called to the kingdom for such a time as this. Friends, you should be thrilled you're in a place of darkness because though you are the light of the world. The light is in you. He's given you the key. He's given you the power. He's given you a rock of revelation. He's building his kingdom and you are a part of it. But what do we do? We get behind our own little closed compounds. We have to stay, st watch out. The devil is coming. The devil is coming. We need to hear the gatekeeper at Hades say, Watch out! The church is coming. They've got the key. They're going to open this. I mean, they're going to stop people from coming in. They're going to ruin our... We got church growth. They got Hades growth. Remember Paul Revere? The British are coming. 
the British are coming. It's time for the church once and for all to say, watch out for the church. Or what, what, I, I, let me say it a little different. It's time for Hades to say, the Christians are coming. The Christians are coming. Friends, the gates of hell can't prevail. We have a key to death and hell that the Lord has given us, friends. We can stop people from going there. No gate can prevail against a church that's flowing with God. The scripture does not say the gates of the abyss will open and let out all the demon spirits into Pandora's box. He said, and I conclude, I will build my church on the gates of Hades where human beings are being deceived and kept in bondage. Deceptions and chains will be released. This means that Hades does not have a prayer against the church that flows with the master. It gives me faith to believe God for millions, if not billions, of unsafe souls playing just outside of the gates of Hades, just ready to blow the whole thing, screw the whole thing up. It reminds me that the devil should be afraid of the church, not us. We're not the ones who should be afraid of the devil. He should be afraid of us. It reminds me I'm giving too much credit to fallen angels, to demonic spirits, and to Satan himself. I know they're real. I know they're real. However, the devil and the demons and the angels are losers, and the church is called to be powerful. It's time, friends, for us to storm the gates of Hades in our home. Friends, in your son's room, in your daughter's room, We've invited the friends right there. Some of our the gates of Hades is in our home in many situations. Our kids are bound by things that exalt itself against the knowledge of God, things that have got such demonic influence. And we just sit back there. I don't know what to do with Charlie. I don't know how to work this thing out, man. It's like he's just so tormented. Come on, you got the key. It's an awesome thing. That's why I'm saved, friends. That's why I love Jesus Christ. How many people do you know? that need the gates to be broken down in their lives. We have the keys. Friends, we have the authority. We have the dunamis. I love it. We have the power to set people free. We have the power to be set free. Because whom the Son sets free, we got the key. Free indeed. Friends, if you need to be set free, I pray for you right now in Jesus' name, be free. You've got a son or daughter, well, they're in bondage. Get some courage. Listen to me now. I know I'm sounding intense, but we're talking about hell today. We're talking about eternity. Here's some good news. Your child, your husband, your wife, this person who's right there at the gates of Hades flirting with the devil. Friends, you have the authority to bind on, he on earth what's already been done in heaven. Freedom to loose these prison doors, to loose these gates, to bring total freedom. I just gave you a pretty elaborate explanation on what hell is, and that's just a little superficial one today. But friends, the church has the keys. Did I mention that yet? The church has the keys. Bill, you're so hyper, you're so intense. Friends, the majority of us in the church today, we're living our life as if we don't have the key or we've lost the key. I'm gonna show you something next week with the key. I do not apologize for going a little longer today. I apologize for not going long enough. This is so important. If you believe there's a heaven to be gained and a hell to be shunned, you grab hold of this. Because friends, I believe in you. Because I believe in Jesus, I believe in the Jesus in you. And I believe the best is yet to come. And part of the revival is getting the key back to the church. I see five-year-olds holding that key. I see eight-year-olds holding that key. I see Gen Z getting this key back. I see millennials getting this key back. I see generation nexters getting this key back. I see baby boomers getting this key back. I see the great generation getting this key back. I see black, white, red, yellow, brown, and olive skin getting this key back. He has given us the keys. It's time for us to go to Hades, the enemy's camp, and take back what the devil has stolen from us. And friends, I promise you, God's favor is on you to accomplish his mandate for you and me. I'll see you in the Zoom room. We're opening it up right away. 
and let's talk this thing out. Love you guys. God's favor is on you.